Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast with Laurent Cortines. Mike is still on assignment being a father. It is Friday, November 4th. In this episode, we will review the UEFA Champions League group winners, review Spurs' near-death experience, and preview the rest of the Premier League. But first, it is the penultimate weekend before the beginning of the World Cup. Now, normally I go into scores and things like that before we get to here, but I think it's time to really think about, holy shit, the World Cup is going to start on November 22nd. We have this week's games and next week's games, and then we're into the World Cup. Uh, What's happening right now is there's a lot of narrative discussion going on about players getting injured. Ben Chilwell just got hurt. Uh, Hin Min Sung had his face broken in his Champions League game. Timo Werner just got hurt. There's a lot of questions on the fairness and the absurdity of this World Cup being in Qatar. Mike and I have said it a million times. This World Cup being in Qatar is absolutely insane. It should never have been here. It should never be here, but it is. And we've got to deal with the outcome of that. We have a country that is in a is in a desert. They've paid a lot of money. They do not have the infrastructure for this thing in Doha. Uh, it's a country of only a couple million people. The city doesn't handle it. I believe I first heard about the issues of it uh, pretty much right away. I mean, England when uh, I guess it's already 12 years ago now, when they when it originally got to Qatar, England and the USA had both put in really big bids and everyone was like, this is corruption at its finest. And in fact, it did bring down UEFA and Slap Bladder and the rest of the people at FIFA, uh, M- Michel Platini, world famous soccer player. So a lot of people did go down with this, including uh, CONCACAF's chief representative. So the fact that this World Cup, the fact that people are in jail simply because of this World Cup is uh, is surprising because the people who did the scam are in jail. But the World Cup is still in Qatar and it's still in the winter. The argument against, the argument for why this World Cup is, I think very often we take a very Eurocentric view or a Western view of the World Cup as that should be in modern countries, you know, that that are at least at best second world, you know, your South Americas or, or, or first world, your European countries. But I think one of the things that, although Sepp Blatter was a, ended up being a crook, I think one of his missions was, hey, I'm expanding FIFA. I want it to be in more places in the world. The world is changing. It's not just Europe. It's not just South America that, you know, we're on the world stage. It is Africa. It is Asia. It is the Middle East. And these countries deserve an opportunity to have the World Cup while they pay me millions of dollars. So I think one of the first ones that we saw was we had the World Cup in South Africa. That was a huge deal for Africa. The fact that there was a World Cup in Africa in a continent that is a major continent. Um, and Qatar getting the World Cup was the was a country in the Middle East that you'd expect to have had it. Um, I think if we really wanted to go back and think about it, the country that represents the most historically most aligned and closest to European values in the Middle East probably would have been Egypt. But they were they were so corrupt and they could never get their act together that it was never going to be their country. I mean, I think Cairo would have been a great city. You would have had the pyramids in the background. But there you have – you've got the corruption. You've got the Arab Spring. We don't know what's going to happen. But Egypt with Nassar's history of trying to be Western and, and make sure the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't all over the place. So, you know, Qatar ended up being the answer. I think, you know, if we think about Saudi Arabia wouldn't have been a good choice or we've got Iran, which is a mess. Weirdly, Iraq and Baghdad would have been a good choice under Saddam because he was secular. He wouldn't have had all this kind of stuff. It was that's why we propped him up. So even though there's this great desire to have this thing not be political, please, no politics. 
Sport reflects society. Society reflects sports. And of course, it's political. Uh, there was a, a note from Gianni Infantino today that said that teams should keep their politics to themselves. One of the mandates of FIFA was that we, we leave politics aside, same way we have the Olympics. We leave politics aside. And I, I, I think I fundamentally agree with that because what other way do we show some of these countries what Western life is like, right? I don't know. I mean, it, I, I'm of two minds. I think Gary Neville has been labeled as a um, as a hypocrite by lots of people. Uh, True Jordy and his gang on on Twitch talked about it. Lots of podcasts. There's been a you know talk sport topic at least once. Whether Gary Neville, who's probably the what's the equivalent in the U.S. the Charles Barkley of uh, of England, a very honest, very political. He says what he wants. Um, sportscaster, like on the sports of the day, we have to hear what Gary Neville says, especially on football in England. People can disagree. That's fine. At least he has a position. He's political. He's very much a person who supports labor and working people. Uh, he comes out against Boris Johnson. Anyway, he went to Qatar. He interviewed folks from Qatar. And he has stated he believes that having sporting events in for lack of a better word, problematic countries is important because at least they're at the table. At least we can talk to them. At least we can show. At least we can try and have a dialogue and be like, hey, you can't really treat people like slaves or actual slaves in terms of building the stadiums in Qatar. Or hey, if you want to be part of our current community, you can disagree with, with alternative lifestyles, gay, lesbian, straight, all those things. And that can be not for your country, but you can't put them in jail and, and beat them. Like you, you, there's a better way to do this. And if you want to be part of our society, you've got to adopt some of these rules in a normal way. Now, whether they want to be, and this is the big question that's happening right now. You know, we were in a multipolar world. We're getting into a more, we were in a, a, a monopolar world with just the US, basically from the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then we're getting into a multipolar world where who are the good guys? Is it China? Is it Russia? Is it Ukraine? Blah, blah, blah. All these things are happening. It's all over the place. And and this World Cup is in the middle of that. But, um, you know, I like to talk politics and sports all at the same time. But I find it interesting. Players are getting hurt. The World Cup is happening. We can't stop it. Uh, it's here. And it starts in two weeks. And I hope that Mike will come back for it because I'd really like to talk some of the games because the World Cup is different. It's something else. It's, it's not better than the football that is coming that comes on a weekly basis or especially later in the season and the cup competitions but it is more important football it matters more than anything once every four years the best 32 now 48 countries in the world who have gone through a grueling qualifying system get to show what football means to them and their country whether the teams are small like Wales that have a last hurrah with their group that have done so well, or a country like the U.S. who are trying to establish ourselves after the debacle of Trinidad and Tobago of players missing the World Cup, or someone like England who, who thinks they have a shot, or France trying to defend their title, or Germany and Brazil and Argentina. There's a lot of narratives coming through. So we'll be covering the World Cup, and I just wanted to get on the record about it's not this week. This week is one week. This is the penultimate week before the last day. And then we go right into the World Cup. So the 15th is the last week of games. And then the World Cup starts. It's crazy. The players have no rest. Usually they have three weeks. In this case, they can have one. Okay. Let us go to the Champions League results. And then we'll go into the previews for the Premier League. Um, the big one here is... Tottenham 2, Marseille 1, Spurs come back on a 95th minute winner by Premier Pierre Emil Herberg. They played terribly for a half, and I mean terrible. Spurs are bad. I don't know how they do it. They somehow get into gear later in the game. I thought that Marseille was much better in this game. Chancel Mbemba with a headed goal where he's unmarked on a foul that is not called but then called and they let the there's a miscommunication between 
Um, my boy Sessignon and a defender it went off his legs. He's supposed to shout. And Basuma, they miss it. And they get a corner. And then Chancel and Bemba scores the corner. So Marseille spend the break, halftime, up a goal. Then Longland brings Spurs in. Spurs only score on crosses. By the way, thank God they have Ivan Perisic, who now has seven assists from cross from set pieces at this point. And then late in the game, as Spurs were pushing, uh, second half, Spurs were much, much better um, and really kicked on and got this game done. And it was all in the balance. So this week started with any team winning. So Marseille thought they were going to be in the Europa League with a draw and could have even won the group. But then they lose in the last minute, and now they're out of Europe entirely. <laughs> so this group, uh, this group D was nuts. Eintracht Frankfurt and Spurs go through. Sporting had a good shot, but really all down the stretch. Spurs get it done. They're still playing terribly. I mean bad. Like first half of Spurs games are basically unwatchable until the second half. And you're like, oh, here they are. I thought that Basuma really started pulling the strings. Betancourt, the midfield for Spurs really started going, hey, we got to fucking win this thing and started pushing forward. And trying to find a way forward. The bad news is Hin Min Sun on a headed goal. Uh, he's challenging for a ball. And the heads go back. And he gets smashed right in the chin and breaks his face. And he's probably going to miss the World Cup. At least the beginning of it. Or and he's definitely going to be wearing a mask. But rather than go through the games. Because there really wasn't much to write home about. City had an amazing moment with um, Rico Lewis scoring his first goal. 17 years old for City's win. Really just a City only thing. But here are the groups. Group A. Napoli and Liverpool go through. Napoli win the group. Despite Liverpool beating them. This win and on goal difference. Napoli go through Ajax in the Europa. Porto and Club Bruges. Porto. Great story. They had won their first two games. But they had been slipping. So Porto gets the win in the group. Um, with Club Bruges in second and Leverkusen going to the Europa. Michael, their European adventure is over. Sh- Simeoneism over. Bayern Munich go undefeated <laughs> in the group. Uh, in a group with Inter and Barcelona, they go undefeated with, for 18. Sorry, they, they don't even draw. They don't drop points. 18, so six out of six. Uh, Bayern with Inter in second, and Barcelona going to the Europa League. Uh, Tottenham, like we said, win their D. Eintracht Frankfurt also going through on a big win for them. Sporting go home. Sad for them. They were really good. Uh, Chelsea go through no problem against uh, with Milan and Salzburg going to the Europa League. Zagreb getting their win against Chelsea early on and not winning another game. Real Madrid and Leipzig go through with Shakhtar going to the Europa. Everyone wanted Shakhtar to win, but they just couldn't pull it off. They're sort of the field story being a nomad team playing in Poland with the war in Ukraine. City go through. Uh, like I said, they get a final win against Sevilla. Um, Rico Lewis with the goal there. Really fun stuff. City cruising. They just don't lose now. Dortmund also uh, in the round of 16 with Sevilla going to the Europa. And in the final group, Benfica score six and go through on goal. Not just away, not just goal difference, but Away goals, we thought they were gone, but they're back. Benfica win road in Haifa and get themselves past PSG. So they're in the top group. This makes a difference because if you win your group versus not winning your group, it depends on the draw. The draw will be on Monday, and we'll go through those things there. Basically, the thing to remember with the draw is in the round of 16, you cannot play a team who you were in a group with. For City, that means no Dortmund. And you cannot play a team from your own country. That means no Liverpool, no Chelsea, and no Spurs. So that only leaves a certain amount of uh, certain amount of permutations for the English teams. All the English teams will be wanting to avoid PSG, and all the other teams will be wanting to avoid Liverpool. So that'll be that. Uh, England sends four teams through, with Italy having three for the first time in a long time. Uh, Juventus going to the Europa League with a terrible season. One other thing of note, um, Rangers of Scotland set the record for the worst Premier League group appearance ever with no wins and a minus 20. They were lucky to be there. They had won against the odds and probably 
probably could have played a little bit better, but they were really bad. So that is the Champions League. And we don't hear from it for ages. That's where it is. The draw comes. Then we'll know. Okay. On to the Premier League. You know it. You love it. I want to change it up a little bit. I think, you know, sometimes the schedule just becomes a bit of a grind and we just go through the matchups. And I think I'd rather kind of go through the table and sort of discuss um, the narratives for each team about where they are, where they stand, where their season has been, what the story has been. Uh, and you can disagree or dis- or agree or whatever. So let's let's just go through the table, say where teams are, see where things are like that. So you can always just look at the table, but let's start at the top for the sake of for the sake of um, programming, just so we get an understanding of where things are. And then, you know, if you want, we can go, go through the schedule afterwards, but let's sort of paint the story of the league right now. So Arsenal, what's Arsenal's narrative? Arsenal's narrative is, are they ready to win the league? This young team with a young manager, do they have the medal and the players and the depth to handle a full Premier League challenge? Uh, Every game they win is another feather in their cap. So we continue to see as they go through big teams, big teams, they beat Spurs, they they lost against United but played well, they beat Liverpool. So we have this story happening to them as they move along and each game will be a hurdle for them. They have another one this week in playing Chelsea and I would expect if they drop points away on Sunday – we'll have a narrative shift saying they're not ready. So we'll see if Potter comes up with something. Um, But I think the team's great. Um, I think they have the horses. It's a question of can they mature enough and and grow as a group? Uh, This is very reminiscent of, I want to say, 96-97 Ajax, who were really young and won the Champions League, one of the more famous Ajax teams with Patrick Clivert and uh, Frank De Boer. Uh, very, and, and 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 Ricard and all those guys, they all got broken up like all Ajax teams do, but this is one of those moments. For City, City's narrative is the same that it is always year, every year, except this year we have a new player. It's robotic. We're favorites in everything, favorites to win the Champions League, favorites to win the league, favorites for everything. Can City win the Champions League? That is our story. That is our narrative. Everything else doesn't matter. FA Cup doesn't matter. Um, league cup doesn't matter. Winning the league is expected. Anything city does is expected and is a, is a triumph of a, of a, this was supposed to happen. Anytime we lose anything, it's a disaster. So with Erling Holland in place, who was the, who's been our story for every game for city's narrative, it's, can you win the champions league with Holland? And the only thing standing in our way. And I hate to say this is, is Pep Guardiola fucking it up, whether that's real or not or true or not, that is the story of City. Pep overthinking, the players not taking it on, him doing something absurd in the middle of a game. Spurs still sitting in third place in the table. That's a big deal. So they have been playing well. They have been getting it done. The the narrative for Spurs is, can Conte get this team to win something? Their story will be whether they can win a trophy. Uh, A top four finish is an achievement, I think, for Conte. And will Conte stay with the team? Can they continue playing like this, being down in games, playing defensive? They're the only one of the top nine, top ten. Of the top ten teams, they're the only defensive first team. Arsenal are attacking progressive uh, attacking City, Newcastle are now, United are trying to be with Ten Hag, Chelsea under Potter, even Fulham are an attacking possession team, Brighton, Liverpool, Crystal Palace, all the way down to Crystal Palace. That's 10 teams all playing on the front foot, progressive, attacking, possession-based, positional football. And then you have Tottenham, who are still playing Italian football from 10 years ago. And that's just Conte's philosophy. I don't think they ha- they can continue to play like that, but that's my opinion. But they're the only ones doing it. They sort of stick out like a sore thumb. So can they win something? 
can they stay in the top four? Newcastle United sitting pretty in fourth, doing really well, playing really well. They don't have any European commitments, having finished, um, you know, 10th last season. It's can they break into the top six? Are they there? Is Eddie Howe the man to take this team into the top four? That's where Newcastle are. They currently have the best defense in the league. They only have one loss. Same with Arsenal and Manchester City. But, but they have six draws. So on XG, if I sort by XG, let's see where the standings are. It's Newcastle in third place based on XG against and Tottenham in third. So the top four are all there. They're just a different order based on XG against. You know I love me some XG. So Newcastle are legitimately where they're supposed to be. Their defense is really good. Um, They scored a little bit more and defended a little bit better. So can they sustain it? Can they stay in the top six? There's no reason they can't be. And then for the next up in a narrative is Man United, whose narrative is a constant shift. I think that United fans will agree that for them it's about progression. It's about even when they lose, are they sticking to their principles? Are they getting better? Are they finding solutions? Are they playing the Ten Hog way? Ten Hog's grips and tentacles and whatever the fuck you want to call are gripping this team, and he has done a good job. He's done a good job. One, the recruitment has worked. The Lissandra Martinez thing has worked. The Anthony thing has worked. And he's going to want to win a trophy or try to, maybe an FA Cup or whatever, and he's finding solutions. Those two games early on, I think he learns from each game. I think that's a key thing that any United fan can be happy about. They're learning. He's learning. He's a neural net processor, a learning computer. He got killed by City. Okay, can't do that again. He goes defensive. You know, he learned from things he couldn't do. He played Maguire, found out he couldn't play. He disciplined the Cristiano thing in the middle of it and says, hey, you got to play. He He walked off the bench. He pulled him, but he brought him back in. So he's not without reason. I think he's establishing rules and protocols and ways United should play, and they are getting better. I think his next step is he's got to get Jaden Sancho firing. I think that other side of the field, those options of having Sancho, Rashford, Marshall, Anthony, and and with Tristano, if he can get some consistent goal scoring, I think United can take off. He solidified the defense. Casemiro has made a difference. That's the story for narrative. Progression, getting better, less mistakes, better stuff. For Chelsea, they already changed their narrative. Theirs is already turmoil from Bowley into sacking Tuchel, now under Potter. Can Potter be the man to take this team forward? That's their story. They want to finish in the top four. There's seven teams now that want to fit six teams that want to finish in the top four. In case you can't do the math, it doesn't fit in. So Chelsea will try and continue. They have a good squad. They have a manager who can use that squad. But can Chelsea find the consistency under Potter to take on what he's saying and, and play more consistent football? They're right there as well. Now we're getting out of our out of our fun teams. I mean, we have one more, Liverpool in ninth. God, I can't believe they're ninth. Uh, Fulham, Fulham are they're gravy right now. Uh, Marco Silva's got this team playing well. Paulinho has been the player of the season from a bottom from a other fourteen perspective. Best defensive midfielder I've seen come in new to the league, standing there with that Harrison Addison Reed, and they have Mitrovic. So they're playing well. They're where they need to be right now for them. It's just keep playing, finish in the top. Maybe late in the season, there's a chance for Europe. Next is Brighton. They got all their wins early under Potter. Potter gets the Chelsea job. Now can Deserby get his ideas in and can they move forward? These two teams, Fulham and Brighton, are just this new middle class of super progressive, well-run clubs that are trying to stay in the league and do new things. Uh, I think for Fulham, there's a fear that Marco Silva, where would he go? I don't know. I think being at Fulham is a good spot. And then Deserby, can he get his stuff going and keep Brighton where they are? Next up is the ever-disappointing Liverpool. We know the woes and hurts of this team. They're in transition. 
they're in transition in almost every way. They're changing from the Mane front three. They're changing from the Henderson Fabinho, from the Henderson midfield. They're changing in defense. Uh, everything's changing, and they have to find a way to find a new way to play, or at least rediscover their old way to play. Uh, I don't think it can be the same. So they're trying to incorporate Nunez. They're trying to incorporate Elliott, the younger players, into the midfield, whether they buy a new midfielder or not. But right now for Klopp, this is a season of transition and trying to find a new stability. The team is inconsistent. Can't keep giving up goals. Cannot keep giving up goals. Their XG is plus nine, but really all of it comes from that big game against um, that big game against um, Bournemouth. Otherwise, they're straight right in the middle. Um, Allison has saved their ass way too many times. And they're just hanging in there. I think, you know, injuries have been hard and all these things, but they've got to get themselves together. So the narrative for Liverpool is, can they get consistent? Can they find a way to get back into the top four? That's going to be a real struggle for them, right, as it stands right now. They are four. Oh, my God. They're eight points out of the top four. They can do it, but we haven't seen it. Next week, Crystal Palace, same record as Liverpool, 4-4-4. Four, four, and four. Crazy. For Palace, it's, is Vieira the man to, to keep the team the way it is? Can they keep playing this attacking style? Um, they're trying to incorporate all their attacking players. And I guess this is the season. Can they let Zaha go? I think that's really the narrative. So Zaha's on the team. He's already 30. They, are they going to give him a new contract? Do they have the players to let Zaha go? And I think that's what Vieira needs to find out this year is through the rest of the season between Eze and Aluise, can they let Zaha go? And that's really their season. Brentford, it's a consolidation season for them. The rest of their season is, can they get better results away from home? We know about Brentford. They win a lot of games through the passion of, of uh, Griffith Park. Night games especially. Can they be better? Uh, number 12 here, Everton's story is consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. I don't think they're in a relegation fight anymore. It's clear that Lampard has got the team solidified. The Awobi onana partnership is there. Now it's time to get that striker with Dominic Calvert-Lewin. I think they're in good shape. It's consolidation. Can they find a way to attack more and be find a way to balance the team? Because I've talked about how they can either defend or attack. Can they find balance? West Ham, I think they're fine. Uh, their XG is much better than where they, they've got way too many losses. West Ham doing the, the, third, the conference league. And the league, they want to be higher up the top. And then the rest of this from 14 down is, can I stay in the league? And I don't want to do all the teams. Bournemouth, is Gary O'Neill the manager? Are they going to appoint him? Leeds, is Jesse Marsh? Are they going to keep him? Aston Villa, we know is a good team. Unai Emery starts his work there to see if they can stay in. Southampton, can they get more consistency with all the young players? We know Hasbudo can be there. They've got to try and stay in the league. Leicester City is in the relegation zone. They need to get out there too good to be there. Wolves and Nottingham Forest. Wolves' problem is got to find goals. They can't score. Jose Sock kept them in the league. I talked about it last season. They were lucky to be where they were, and now it's really coming to roost. And then we know about Nottingham Forest. After the last game, really bad. After the break, can uh, Steve Cooper get this team moving forward? That's the narratives for all the teams. Wowie zowie. Uh, I still think top four will be Arsenal, City. City will win the league. Arsenal in second. Newcastle third. Man United fourth. Tottenham going to fall out along with Chelsea. Too much transition. Need consistency. Okay. Let's go. Two, the schedule. Wow, here we go. They had daylight savings time. Games are going to start earlier. West Coast, East Coast, 11 a.m. game. West Coast, 8 a.m. 
That's nice. I get an extra hour. They already, they're ahead of us already. So the weekend starts with a must win six pointer. Nottingham Forest at home versus Brentford. This is a big game. Steve Cooper needs this game. He must get a result out of this game. As much as I love uh, Thomas Frank, I would expect Brentford away at the city ground. Going to have a struggle. Um, Brentford are better. Ivan Tony may even go to the World Cup. But this is a big one. Two six pointers. Then Leeds host Bournemouth. Another one. Jesse Marsh, you've got to win these games. As much as I like Bournemouth and Gary O'Neill has done a great job, they've been lucky. Uh, Leeds have been the better side. Their underlying numbers are actually quite good. Uh, I would expect the XG machine tells me that... Oh, here we go. The XG machine tells me that Leeds... Leeds are a, mid, a, a middle of the table team. They have a positive XG. What they're doing is they're not scoring and giving up too many more goals than you'd expect. They should have scored two more, and they've given up three more than they should have. Their XG is positive, whereas Bournemouth is last in the league. Yikes. So I would expect that um, by the numbers, Leeds should win this game especially at home. But we don't do things on paper. We know that. But this is a game that Jesse Marsh will look at. He'll look at the numbers. He's talked about underlying numbers and say, this is a game we have to have. Manchester City at home versus Fulham. This game's going to be tough for City. I know, I know. You say that all the time. But it will be. Uh, Fulham are really good. Mitrovic poses a problem. And I think Pep will get on the team and say, hey, this team's good. Don't fuck around. Uh, I expect City, this will be an open game. This will be a good game, I think. City will score some goals. Questions on whether Holland will play? My guess is no. He's been out with a foot, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, Julian Alvarez played well, did get a goal in the in the uh, Champions League game, so we get to see more of him. Then, Wolves play Brighton. These are all the Saturday games. Uh, I'm more interested in to see how Brighton play. Wolves are terrible. Brighton are a great defense. I would expect Brighton to win this game 1-0 on a on an own goal because Brighton can't score anyway. And then the last game of the day on Saturday is Everton Leicester City. This will be a good game because I think Everton at home are much more attacking, much more inspired and Leicester City are the top scoring team outside of the big boys. So they do score a lot but they give up a lot. So we'll see where Leicester come up. I just want to double check that yeah, Leicester on 21 goals, which puts them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th in the league in goals scored. So they're a good scoring team when you compare that to Everton, who only have 11. They've scored 10 more goals. They've had some barn burners where they've lost, you know, 3, 6, 3 or stuff like that. But Leicester should like their chances. Brentford, I mean, sorry, Fulham are good at home. I mean, sorry, Everton are good at home and a very good defense. Tarkovsky and Corner Cody are going to have their work cut out for them, but I'd expect a good one there. Then, Sunday, November 6th, when we move the clocks, uh, we have all the big games, big, big games. Chelsea versus Arsenal. Another test goes back to the narrative. Chelsea come into this game having won their group. Arsenal come into their game on a Sunday, Thursday, so they'll have one less day of rest. This will be a challenge. I expect Potter to come up with something to try and nullify Arsenal's attack. There probably won't be Bakari Saka. He came off last week with a knock. We'll see. Chelsea's lineups guesses are as good as a guess to anyone. They're lacking in defense. No Chab, sorry. No Fofana. No Chilwell, no Reese James. So how the wingbacks of Chelsea deal with Martinelli and Saka or or Reese Reese Nelson is a question. The wide areas are going to be where this game is decided. And then Raheem Sterling, we need a game from you. You're better than this. I did say that Raheem Sterling was not going to score for Chelsea. I'm correct. <laughs> uh, he needs balls put into the right place. He's probably in the right places, just no one passes him the ball. Because um, uh, Mason Mount is the best deep 
deeper attacker, sort of number 10 attacker for Chelsea, but they don't have an Odegaard. He's more of a carrier shooter than a passer. And so there isn't really that creative force that can get balls from the box to players on the byline to players in the back post. So that's always a problem. They have a really good creator because their creativity was coming from the wings and their ball's gone. No Chilwell, no Reese James. So Chelsea are going to have to try and grind this out and try to stop Arsenal's attack from scoring. Then a North, a, a London derby, West Ham versus Crystal Palace. I feel like these two teams never play each other. I feel like West Ham, Crystal Palace, there's no connection between these two teams at all. Uh, but, you know, West Ham are okay. Crystal Palace are okay. Uh, both teams are in a transition to more attacking kind of style. I wonder if West Ham will go back to their sort of deep-lying attack style and let Crystal Palace come on to them. Crystal Palace really do aren't mature enough to know that it makes West Ham not want to do what they want to do. So I think West Ham will win this game because Palace will try and attack them. Southampton in the greatest distance apart game. Southampton hosts Newcastle. Again, I don't know what's going to happen. Southampton are okay at home. Newcastle traveling all the way down from Newcastle to Southampton. Who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Obviously, Newcastle are now a top four team. They're actually in the top four and have the XG to show it. So I'd expect Newcastle to win, but I don't know. Uh, this They are favorites. These are new times for Newcastle. They are favorites. And United go to Villa. This will be Unai Emery's first game. He's going to fucking muck it up. He is going to try and make this game as difficult as possible for Manchester United. And this will be a test for United. Can they break an Unai Emery coach team down? We shall see. Because while United do have lockpickers in Ericsson and and is to a lesser extent, but definitely Ericsson. They don't have great finishers. But what about Cristiano? Cristiano's a great finisher. But does he get where he needs to go? Can you get the ball up the pitch if he's not pressing? So he, he giveth and taketh away. Yes, if you could just put him in the box and not have to get to the box, he's great. But <laughs> I don't know. So United will be favored here. But uh, I like I like this game as well. And then the final game of the day, Liverpool visiting Tottenham Hotspur. Late game Sunday. Massive game for Spurs. Massive game for Spurs. They cannot come out passive against Liverpool. Go punch them in the face. You're better than them. Liverpool on the road are awful. If you don't try and get a goal by attacking them, they will beat you. Attack, attack, attack. If you don't attack, you can't get that first goal that Liverpool always give up. If you sit back, Liverpool are going to pick you apart. Thiago and Fabinho, if you don't attack them, you don't expose their weakness. Spurs, I want more from you. Uh, Liverpool probably... Favorites? Maybe? No. Tottenham at home are favorites. But still a tough game. Still difficult. Tottenham will try and win this game on a set piece and then shut up shop and go home. That's what they've been doing. So we'll see where they get to with the idea. Anyway. That's it. That was the Squeaky Bomb Time Podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Network and big fans of Fan Hub. We record on Tuesday and Friday, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're li- listening on Apple, please rate, review, show, and make a difference and enjoy the football. 